Welcome to Norwich Cathedral. I'm Jane Hedges, the Dean here, and we're delighted that you're joining us for the first of our new series of Science in the Café, Diffy is Coming. Dinosaurs dominated the Earth for some 160 million years, becoming extinct 66 million years ago. Their dominance was based on the simple evolutionary rule of the survival of the fittest. Mammals developed some 210 million years ago and have been the dominant class of animal since the dinosaurs disappeared. A significant part of the success of mammals has been the development of communities in which, while remaining individuals, members will subjugate themselves to their own, subjugate their own needs to those of the community as a whole. As we prepare for the arrival of Dippy in January, we hope that you will join us for all three of our conversations. Scientists and our resident theologian, Canon Peter Dahl, will help us explore aspects of this mutual interdependence in the context of the provision of healthcare and with particular reference to the issues raised by the COVID-19 pandemic. In each session, our speakers will give an introductory talk of around 10 minutes, and this will be followed by a panel discussion and then the opportunity for you to send in questions in the days to come via email, and we'll tell you a little bit about that later. This evening, we're tackling the subject of citizens' rights and moral obligations. The discussion will develop around how a community decides the allocation of resources into healthcare and how decisions are made about distribution and equity of delivery and how we deal with the use and misuse of our health service. We will hear first from Professor Mark Wilkinson from the Norwich Med Medical School and then from Professor Andy Jones, also from Norwich Medical School and their contribution will be followed by a reflection from the Reverend Canon Dr. Peter Doll, our Canon Librarian. So first then, we hand over to Mark. Hello. Um, Jane and I started talking about this over a year ago now, um, and it was something of a challenge to lead from dinosaurs through to um, modern ethics of medical care. But if we think about it, the dinosaurs we know from paleontology tended to live in clusters, probably because that's where the food was. And if we look at some of their closest living relatives, birds, we can find that a social structure has evolved. Wood pigeons, probably like Dippy before them, tend to flock together because that's where the food is. They will have some degree of social interaction if one of them takes alarm and they'll fly off but there's no evidence of a really strong structure. If you compare that with geese, we're all familiar with the arrowhead and the goose at the front is doing all the hard work. It is so much easier to be one of the geese behind because you're flying in the slipstream of the one in front, it's much less difficult. When the goose in the front starts to tire, they drop back, one of the others replaces them. So each goose, for a period of time, is putting themselves at a physical disadvantage for the good of the flock and collectively they all benefit. It's even more developed when you see rooks. Rooks, when they're feeding, some of the birds will always be in the air acting as sentries and they're replaced steadily, very much the same way as the geese work. But in a rookery there are desirable nest sites in the centre, in the strong trees where they're not going to be damaged by high wind. Those are occupied by the pinnacle birds, the top of the pecking order, so to speak. The thing about all of these social structures, however organised they are, is any individual can replace any other individual. They're none of them unique. If we take human society, uh, we can see that even um, way back in the days of Aristotle, it was recognised that as a society we had evolved to a state where we could no longer exist in isolation. Each person has a role and we cannot survive without everybody else. 
even if we're called Bear Grylls, we have to have the rest of the community around us. And nowhere is this more evident than it is in healthcare. To become a consultant in the NHS these days takes around 15 to 20 years of training. You can't pick a man off the street or woman um, and replace a healthcare professional. We don't all have the same skill set. We are dependent upon our colleagues. And in healthcare, we recognised, again, two and a half thousand years ago, it was recognised that for physicians, this put us in a unique position. Everybody is, to a certain extent, in a unique position. So my view is that, to a certain extent, the ethics, the morality of healthcare is better documented, perhaps, than the morality of society. But actually, it's a fairly good indication of the rules that make a society work. So Hippocrates, way back then, started with the view that the first responsibility of a doctor is not to harm his patients. The second responsibility is to always do good for your patients, which perhaps tells us more about the quality of medical care in those days, because now we use uh, a construct written by Beecham and Childress 35 years ago, where they talk about four pillars of medical ethics, starting with beneficence, their first principle, you almost always aim to do good for your patient. Non-maleficence, do no harm. Obviously, they just reverse the first two of Hippocrates. In the days of Hippocrates, people didn't have great autonomy, whereas now we recognise the importance of an individual's right to decide for themselves. So, Beecham and Childress put respect for autonomy very high on their list. And then we come to justice, which is more about how society delivers healthcare. And I think Andy, who follows me, will pick up on this much more. But it's the expectation that everybody will be treated the same within the rules of the society that we're dependent upon. Um, we probably aren't going to spend a lot of time comparing British and American or Swedish or whatever healthcare systems. So largely we'll be reflecting on the work of the NHS where everybody has the same rights in law, irrespective of their ability to pay. And that's pretty much how healthcare works. If we'd have been giving this talk when we first intended, I wouldn't have been able to put this slide up because COVID hadn't happened. But I think it's telling that this is an illustration from the message that the English government, Boris Johnson and his cabinet, put out at the very start of the very first lockdown back in March, where the most important thing is protect the NHS, protect our health care services, because society is absolutely dependent on them and we fear there's a risk that they'll collapse. So we all shut ourselves up in our homes. We took a knock. We did something for the good of society, which was disadvantageous. And speaking for myself, I found not having contact with my children and grandchildren for that period of time was actually really difficult. Um, I missed them terribly, so it was a disadvantage. Um, we all queued. We queued very carefully, socially distancing. Uh, this isn't Waitrose, but I started doing it in Waitrose in March, and I'm still doing it in Waitrose now, except when I go to Sainsbury's. Um, and we wore masks. And I think everybody is aware that we don't wear a mask for our own benefit. We wear a mask so that we don't pass COVID inadvertently to somebody else, even if we didn't know we had it. The wearing of the mask is to protect everybody else in society. I don't actually much like wearing a mask, so I wear one, but I feel terribly proud that I'm taking a hit for society to benefit everybody else. It's about helping other people. There are frustrations. There was a lot of talk about the wonders of the vaccination when it comes through. And I believe that vaccinations will be a very, very important tool in the fight against COVID. And uh, this uh, cartoon, which I lifted from an American journal, is clearly a stab at the government. But I think we all recognise that ignorance and paranoia are not confined to our political masters. These are things which we all suffer from. People who choose to be ignorant about the rules or paranoid. Moving away from COVID, um, 
you can see how much pressure society puts on people to get vaccinations uh, from the work in, from Australia, where uh, children are offered vaccinations against the childhood diseases, as we all were. Um, and if you choose not to have your child vaccinated, the Australian government won't give you child support payments. You are not paid money for your children unless you have them vaccinated. They are having a debate in Australia at the moment as to whether they will apply the same sort of rule for vaccination against COVID when it is available. Who will choose to have that vaccination? I would have stopped there had we been giving this talk a few weeks ago. But then, in the last week or so, I've been seeing more about the problems of people's patients running out. We're becoming more irritated by people who are breaking the rules as we see them. There is a lot of stress and anxiety coming out of it. Um, we can see that individuals are beginning to react to the rules. Um, and I must be honest, I was walking around my local Tesco's where somebody walked the wrong way around. And even though there were only the two of us in the shop, I still found it annoying. I got cross with him for not following the rules. Um, and I think that we will begin to see more COVID rage. And this really comes back to what I was saying. We as individuals recognise that society has rules and we try and follow those rules. And we recognise that at times we will be disadvantaged. And the corollary of that is that we also get upset by other people who seem to willfully break those rules. I'm going to stop now and pass you on to Professor Andy Jones from the University. So I thought I'd, um, I'd start my um, slot by picking up on one of the terms that Mark used, justice. Mark described justice as, as being something you know, akin to people getting what they need in society and the healthcare that they require. But, but you could kind of take a different definition of justice, which says the same thing, but is perhaps rather more abrupt and direct. When people receive what they deserve, you had it coming, that's justice. It's, it's the same word, but it's a different way of looking at things. And I think justice and liberty are words that are often worth thinking about together. So what's liberty? It's the state of being free within society from oppressive restrictions imposed on authority, um, by, by authority, by one's way of life, behaviour or political views. So in other words, we, we can do what we want, but, but people shouldn't be telling us what to do. It's up to us as individuals to decide how we want to live our lives. And it's not up to anyone else, the government or any other ruling bodies, um, you know, to tell us how to do that. So, so how do liberty and justice go together? Well, well perhaps if we um, are looking for liberty, we can also expect justice. Perhaps if we decide we, we can do what we want, the consequences of that decision and something that we've got to expect and we've got to accept is justice. So this is a man that, that needs no introduction. Uh, love him or hate him, we all know him. Donald Trump, the President of the USA. And uh, at the time I'm giving this presentation, Donald Trump's in hospital, having been diagnosed with COVID-19. Um, now, of course, he's not only an individual, and as an individual, he can make decisions about what's right for him, what he wants to do, he has his own beliefs. But he's also president of um, arguably the most powerful country in the world and is therefore governing many, many millions of citizens. So if we look at what Donald Trump's been saying about COVID, it's kind of quite interesting. So if we go back to January the 22nd, right at the start of the epidemic, we have it totally under control. It's one person coming in from China, just one person. It's going to be just fine, pretty upbeat, no cause for alarm there. Go through to the 11th of March, the virus will not have a chance against us. No nation is more prepared or more resilient 
in the United States. Okay, let's go forward again in time. 19th of May now. When we have a lot of cases, I don't look at it as a bad thing. It's a badge of honour, really. It's a badge of honour. And, of course, he was referring to the fact that at the time he saw America having lots of cases because there was, there was very good um, surveillance. And then very recent, to the time I'm giving this presentation, when Joe Biden, the Democratic, Democratic um, candidate who's challenging him in the upcoming elections, makes a speech... He has his mask hanging down, because you know what? It gives him a feeling of security. If I was a psychiatrist, I'd say this guy's got some big issues. We know that Donald Trump wasn't keen on wearing masks. So what do we hear from Trump? Well, on the 2nd of October, he tweets that he's tested positive for COVID-19. We will get this through, get through this together. So, going back to those, those original terms that I was discussing, you know, Donald Trump has shown liberty, he makes his own decisions. It's the fact that he's ended up contracting COVID-19. Is that justice? Could we really see that as justice? What about the American citizens, the people that have listened to Donald Trump and looked to him for guidance during the epidemic. At the time of this presentation, over 200,000 deaths from COVID in the United States. Whatever way you look at it, one of the highest mortality rates in the world. What does justice look like for these people? And what role did the government play in perhaps the government failing in protecting them? Boris Johnson, our own Prime Minister here in the United Kingdom, and of course somebody else who's contracted COVID, in this case very early on in the epidemic. On September the 22nd of this year, he was talking about the challenges of getting the British people to conform, the sort of things that Mark was talking about in, in his presentation. And he said, our country is a freedom-living country. Virtually every advance from free speech to democracy has come from this country. And it's very difficult to ask the British population to follow guidelines and to obey guidelines. So that's kind of quite interesting. What he's saying is, well, we want to be free. Um, and inevitably, if we've got this freedom, we shouldn't be expected to do what we're told, because that's incompatible with freedom. Freedom means we can do what we want. So we hear the nanny state, this term the nanny state, which is actually a term that's, that's invented here in the UK. The nanny state comes about a lot, that the state is suppressing individuals by telling us what to do. Don't drink, don't smoke. Don't fly an aircraft because it will lead to climate change. If you go out, wear your masks. Don't touch other people. Sanitise your hands. Don't have fun. The nanny state tells us what to do and it tells us what to do because it's a good thing for us. So do we need the nanny state? What happens if the nanny state stops telling us what to do? Or if we just ignore the nanny state and, and do what we want? Are we going to end up in trouble. So Mark was talking about altruism in his talk and about you know, how flocks of birds work together to protect each other. We see the geese flying in a V-shape and of course the geese at the front take the hit uh, and use up more energy for the geese at the back. But in the case of the geese, those geese at the back know that they're going to be at the front and the geese at the front know that they're going to be at the back at some time. So the benefit and the pain are being shared the whole while. Okay, you can see what's in it for you. Sometimes it's more difficult to see what's in it for us. If we wear a mask, do we really benefit? It's other people that benefit. We often believe that we're not going to catch COVID, or if we do, it's not going to be severe. So why should we be restricted just to help other people? And I think that's one of the problems. Of course there are lots of people 
that will generally sacrifice their well-being for others. But there are a lot of other people that find it much more difficult to do if there isn't clear benefit. Let me just finish off by looking at the situation in, in Italy. So Italy took a really big hit early in the COVID pandemic. It had uh, a big concentration of cases and one of the steepest trajectories um, in Europe. But if we look at the statistics for Italy now, at the time I'm giving this presentation, they look a lot rosier. Like other countries, there's been an increase in the number of cases, partly down to increasing surveillance, not entirely. But mortality in Italy has remained stubbornly low, and of course, ultimately, that's a really key indicator of how serious a disease is. So Italy saw things bad at the start, but now things are better. And um, this is a, a quote by the Italian Deputy Prime Minister, and he's responding to that quote that I just uh, showed you by Boris Johnson. And he said, I can smile a bit at Boris's comments. When you respect the rules, there's freedom. We're free now to do the majority of things because we were very strict with the rules. So in other words, freedom isn't really doing what you want whenever you want to do it. But what freedom is, is conforming to what we need to do for society because we know at some point in the future we'll therefore be free and able to live the lives that we want to live. Why has Italy been so good at doing this? Well, this is just a quote from an Italian citizen. We've sensed death all around us, so now we need to protect each other in a way, in any way that we can. Those people saw how bad the COVID pandemic can really be, and they saw it at first hand. And I just want to finish by raising the question as to whether we need to have really stared the devil in the eyes and seen the fear that that brings in order to behave in a way that we're truly being altruistic and looking after society in general at the expense of our own short-term well-being. Thank you. Mark, in his talk, offered, as it were, a biological genealogy of the origin and development of human ethics and Andy in, in the light of current events. But I would like to look at the same topic from a philosophical and historical context perspective. Western culture has been shaped by the growth of Christianity, which itself developed from the conjunction of Jewish religion, Greek philosophy, and the Roman Empire. The strength of Greek culture lay primarily in its mastery of logic, mathematics, and natural science. The Roman world was chiefly concerned with government, law, and the preservation of a peaceful order by force if necessary. The unique insight that Judaism brought to this mix was that every human being has an equal and inalienable dignity and worth. This was not something claimed by any Greek or Roman, and as far as the Jews were concerned, it was nothing that any human could claim to earn or to deserve but held solely because God creates every person, as Genesis puts it, in his image and likeness. This is not a matter of human beings looking like God, but that God makes all women and men capable of knowing him and sharing his divine life, which is their ultimate destiny. Christianity intensified this claim by teaching the Incarnation, that God himself assumed human flesh and mortality in Jesus Christ. Nothing like this has ever been claimed by any other religion. Most Jews could not then and have not since been able to accept this teaching. The Incarnation was equally an affront to the pagan world, which did not accept that divinity could take on the materiality of the world, which pagans regarded as inescapably evil or that there could be any equality in a human society governed by a hierarchy of wealth, power, and status. In the humanity of Jesus, however, God made himself our brother, our equal. Jesus, in his particular care for the sick, the poor, and the outcast, 
was fundamentally at odds with the way that the Greeks and Romans looked at the world. In case I th you think I'm claiming too much on the part of Christianity, Luc Ferry, the French secular humanist and philosopher, points out in his book A Brief History of Human Thought. In, contra in contrast with the Greek understanding of humanity, Christianity was to introduce the notion that humanity was fundamentally identical, that human beings were equal in dignity, an unprecedented idea at the time and one to which our world owes its entire democratic inheritance. The corollary of the Jewish insistence on the equal dignity of all people is that God also made them for society, for an existence of mutual interdependence in which the powerful and wealthy have an obligation to care for the poor and the vulnerable, or as the Jewish prophets usually expressed it, the widow, the orphan, and the stranger within your gates. This is based on a recognition of the ultimate dependence of all people on God and his gifts. As Jesus taught his disciples, love one another as I have loved you. The other element which it is essential for us to grasp is that God does not force his love upon us. We as human beings are free to accept it or to reject it. This is the essence of human freedom. Likewise, it is our choice whether or not to love and care for one another as a part of society, or whether to live as selfish individualists. The challenge is, then, how to make love and generosity more attractive than selfish individualism. The subsequent adoption by the Roman Empire of Christianity as its state religion is one of the strangest stories in human history. Romans regarded Christians as atheists because they refused to make sacrifices to the gods. In the Jews, this was excusable as an ancient tradition belonging to their particular culture. But Christians came from every and any ethnic group, and their critical rejection of the gods was deemed offensive and exclusive. Christians were countercultural within the empire in seeing the right and the good as superior to the pursuit of power, honor, wealth, and sexual satisfaction. Christians being invited to the seat of power in the Roman world is the only example that occurs to me of the meek inheriting the earth without force and indeed without apparently desiring it. The Roman adoption of Christianity entailed it accepting a number of changes to their assumptions about the world. Christians grounded all their ethics on the law of love, and thus rejected the classical antithesis between barbaric conduct springing from emotion and civilized conduct from reason. Passion and reason were brought together to achieve a higher righteousness. In contrast with the manners of pagan Rome, Christians introduced a stress on the sanctity of human life, on charity for the weak and the vulnerable, on the evils of sexual license, and on the wickedness of suicide, gladiatorial contests, and infanticide. Their emphasis on love, gentleness, humility, joy, and peace was a departure from the ethical ideals of the pagan world and promoted a new way of being human. Once Christianity became allied to the state, it made many compromises for the sake of that relationship and the power that it brought. But at least part of the church always remained faithful to its commitment to spread its ethical values in the societies it served. If, for example, we look at medieval England, we may see only a vastly unequal society governed by feudal values. But for its own time, its social systems were enlightened and based on Christian reciprocity and religiously inspired constraints on individual action. R. H. Tawney, in his classic study, Religion and the Rise of Capitalism, argued that economic modernization and ultimately industrialization had their origins in the decline of Christian values and the holistic worldview of the late medieval period. Nevertheless, in the early modern period, European society was still avowedly Christian, albeit with an increasing number of competing views 
about what kind of Christianity that was. Even in the 18th century, despite the voices claiming a new age of reason, the values espoused were still fundamentally Christian. As Herbert Butterfield argued in his lectures, Christianity in European History, much of the whole enterprise of the Age of Reason was to all intents and purposes the creation of a secularized Christianity or a secularized Christian outlook. Christian sentiments lingered like after music in the bosoms of men who had jettisoned Christian dogma. Thus, when Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal, he may have imagined he was enunciating a general human principle but it was, as we have already noted, an idea that found its origin nowhere other than the Bible. As Butterfield argues, humanism and humanitarianism, liberalism and internationalism, then, emerge as the result of a tendency to translate into secular terms certain movements and aspirations which had characterized a Christian civilization. From 1660, however, they began to change into secular ideals, and they forget their origin, pretending to stand entirely on their own feet and turning their backs on the religion that had been their parent. All of them lost something by this fact. All of them are thin and attenuated when compared with the Christian version of them which had existed previously. Butterfield was writing from the perspective of the mid-20th century when the Christian tradition still informed the ideals that created the National Health Service and the rest of the welfare state, as well as of the European Union. Our society today is much more deeply post-Christian, and the Christian ideals of human equality, international cooperation, and community service are increasingly being challenged, not only by political movements, but also by governments even in the West, even in Europe. The NHS is held today as the standard bearer of our civilized values, but the generosity and human dignity it epitomizes are by no means natural or essential human instincts. They emerge from a distinctly Jewish Christian worldview. When, as Marcus pointed out, people's patience is running out because they are frightened about the future, when resources are tight and getting tighter, Will we feel able to continue to offer that generous provision, free at the point of need? In a society no longer rooted in Christianity, can the belief that every human life is of equal value, or the ideal that is the common good, survive? How will we ever again make mutuality and generosity to those in need foundational to our society, so that citizens will want to choose what is good for all, and not merely for themselves. Thank you. Okay. So I'd like to thank you all. I mean, they were they were fascinating presentations, and that there were there were quite a lot of common themes running through those, as well as as well as some differences too. But I think one of the um, things that w w might be quite interesting to just explore together a little bit to start with is that when when we first conceived of this evening, we were going to have the title of the survival of the fittest, partly because of course we, we this is about Dippy and you know, dinosaurs became extinct, and we're we're living in a world now where you know, we've become so strong as human beings that a lot of other species are, are under threat. Um, you've talked a lot about COVID-19 and we're aware that actually there are certain people that are really, really susceptible to it. And um, I, I wonder whether you, you would want to comment on, well, is it, is it a kind of natural thing that's happening around us that, that this, this horrible virus is taking people that are, are, are less strong than others? I, I'm going to start with an absolutely controversial and knowingly so view. Um, it's not my personal view, but if I was going to design a virus for the good of mankind, I'd have one that killed the elderly and the infirm because they are net recipients from society and give less back than everybody else. And that's pretty much what COVID does. Um, so, yeah. I don't, I don't subscribe to the view that anybody designed this deliberately, but I think it is a, a natural phenomenon which 
you know, is very much working for survival of the fittest. So, yeah, that does seem to be a, a truth. But we, um, I mean, if you take a purely evolutionary perspective, of course, our, our, we're here to, to pass our DNA on, and evolution is about passing good quality DNA on, and therefore survival of the fittest fits well, because if the, if the DNA isn't as good a quality, it should have a lower probability of being passed on. I do wonder if there's an additional thing there, though, in that um, we get, or at least many of us, get pleasure from supporting other people. So it's thinking about, you know, actually, it's nice to look after people, and we feel good by doing that, and we benefit personally. And um, that's kind of overridden, I think, a little bit of this, this need to, to, to maintain the highest quality DNA. Um, and, it, and it's brought that, that sort of caring element, um, which, which we see in the way that you know, our health service is, is, is structured and the way that at least society tends to operate. And of course you talked a lot about society in your presentations and, and the, the, there is the saying around that you know you judge a society by the way that it looks after its most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'd be a pretty bad society wouldn't we, if we just said, oh actually we'll just let people that are weaker go to the wall. I don't know, Peter, you'll probably want to comment on that. Well, I mean, I think that, um, I, I think it's clear as a society we don't believe in the survival of the fittest because I mean, we look after endangered species of animals and, and want to preserve them. And likewise, we, we value, you know, if, if people who are older are, are net takers from society uh, in an economic sense, they also give to us in terms of, of, of wisdom and experience and uh, understanding the way the world works. And all of our families would be poorer if they didn't have you know, the older generation to um, help sustain and encourage us. Do we, do we have a problem, though, Peter, with the sort of De decline of the prominence of Christianity in that you said about you know looking after people preventing species from becoming extinct mm -hmm. and of course some people do, do care about that mm -hmm. but a lot of ex species are becoming extinct mm -hmm. as a society when we're, we're not achieving equilibrium and, and I'm wondering if there's um, an increasing disconnect um, compared to if we went back decade centuries between the sort of Christian teachings mm -hmm. and the way that society actually operates and people are losing touch um, with what Christianity says is a good thing to do? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there is something to that in that, uh, you know, in principle, we hold to the ideal that every member of our society is, is equal, of equal value. Every human life is of equal value. But if we look at that the, the policies or the, you know, the fact of, of the way life is turning out now, that it, you know, it is the most, most vulnerable, uh, the poorest, the homeless, uh, the people who are going hungry in our streets, that you know, if, if we made a, you know, a very small decision to, to value their lives the same way we value the lives of wealthy people, we could make that difference to their lives. But the fact that there have been this, this homelessness and hunger problem for generations number of children in our society who are living below the poverty line, it shows that we don't actually really value every human life the same. I, um, I think actually also looking at this from a healthcare point of view, I sometimes wonder if we've got our priorities wrong in that we are seeking to preserve life in terms of quantity, the older the better, not in terms of quality. Um, I visited my mother who's nearly 90 and she was saying that you know she's not seen her children there are four of us her 13 grandchildren for the period of lockdown um, she doesn't expect to live for that many years so the three or four months of lockdown was a significant proportion of the remainder of her life and maybe she would have rather taken the risk and seen her grandchildren and I think particularly as people are entering their 90s and we're seeking to preserve their life at all costs, I wonder if as a profession we've lost sight of what really matters. It's the quality of somebody's life. And, and I, COVID demonstrates that. And I think a really interesting thing there is we contrast how we treat other human beings with how we treat pets. So yes. we have no problem at all putting an animal down because we see it as, as suffering. It's the right thing to do. 
But the idea of doing that to a human is incredibly controversial, even though, of course, it does happen. But it's very controversial. And, and that, to me, seems something that's really hard to reconcile. Why is it humane to put down a dog that's suffering, but, but we do all we can to keep somebody's heart beating when their quality of life is so poor? And there might be a difference, I think, might there, between actually putting somebody down... And, and, and actually letting nature run its course and making sure that you kind of care for people and make them comfortable at the mm. same time as actually not trying to preserve life indefinitely. And I do think and maybe I mean, we probably ought to perhaps wrap this particular question up and, and, and move on to other things, but it, this might be something for people to reflect on at home, I think. But these very big questions that face us at the moment around the care of the elderly and whether or not actually we're being rather patronising to old people at the moment and so not actually giving people the choice of, mm -hmm. of being able to be with their loved ones rather than, you know, and to take the risk, as you've said, mm -hmm. um, and whether that's inhumane in itself, actually, the fact that people are not allowed to hug somebody or be with, be with a loved one that, that, they've, that they've been married to for 60 years or whatever. So there are some huge questions, I think, around what, what do we... What does real caring really mean um, mm. for people? I wonder if we can perhaps move in. You talked, I think, all of the talks, um, to some extent, um, focus a little bit on the contrast between the way that our health service is run here, here in this country and, and the way that the American um, health service runs. And once again, we, we've seen, uh, we, we've uh, said that uh, President Trump is, is suffering from COVID at the moment, but we've also seen in the news how he's getting absolute tip-top treatment. Um, I wonder if, if you want to comment on, on the way, again, that, that resources are available to, 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 to certain people and not to others. I think it, I speak from a, somebody who believes passionately in, in the NHS free at point of delivery. I think the American healthcare system is one which says that justice is based on a different rule, your, your ability to pay. Perhaps, you know, the changes President Trump is attempting to make by reversing the changes of Obamacare uh, illustrate that very well. The American system is you get what you can afford rather than what the medical profession perceive that you need. So I think there is a huge difference between um, the two systems. Uh, and I would find it very uncomfortable personally working in as a healthcare professional in a system where I have to turn people away simply because they can't afford it. Mm. I, think, I think that Andy and his you know, uh, dealing with the issue of justice um, raises a highlight in, in that you know, in the American system, and I speak as an American by birth, you know, the, the idea of justice is, is much more hard-edged than it is with us. And that you know, for Americans, you know, the, you know, those who are prospered are, are, are deemed to be you know, favored by God, as it were. And you know, if you don't prosper, if you can't, if you can't make a go of it in, in American society, which is the freest in the world, then you don't deserve it. You don't deserve the rewards that people you know, who've, who've prospered have got. Uh, it's, it's a mu and that is a view that is shared not just by you know, Donald Trump, but by lots of his supporters who, who, who don't want subsidized or don't think they deserve subsidized health care. And it, I agree with you. It, it, to me, uh, in NHS is a mark of a civilized society, that, that it should be there for those who need it. But you know, the, the assumptions, even though you know, American and Britain are quite close in many ways, the assumptions that govern health care are entirely different. So, so how's, um, how's that? Because really, when, when we think of, about, of America, we think about polarization, don't we, in, in all respects. In, society and healthcare, but, but also in religion, as, as you were alluding to there, Peter, you know, we've got this polarised political views, which seem to sit as a, as a non-religious person that, that's interested in such things, mm -hmm. they seem to sit with a very polarised view of religion. Mm -hmm. And how do you see, how has that evolution occurred with, within society, that we have people on the, what we would say is the far right, extremely mm. religious, mm. which I would think of as being quite a liberal view, but actually when you look at their political leanings, they're not. What, what's, what's happened in America? Well, it's, it's difficult to be precise about it, but I think a lot of it has to do with the Reformation divide. And if you look at Catholic Church teaching now, huge emphasis on the importance of the common good, 
that you know what is good for everyone is you know is is what is right to follow. Um, uh, within the American context, the the, sort of the the Calvinist Puritan divide really has uh, I think guided a lot of people's thinking about this, and that there's there's a much stronger feeling of, of judgment and receiving just desserts, and that if you don't work hard, if you don't if you don't earn um, health care or whatever it might be, then, then then you don't deserve it. And I, I, I think a lot of the difference comes down to uh, that that Reformation divide and that that Puritan conscience, as it were, has mightily prospered in, in, in the United States. And, and, and as, a, as a Christian in, in the UK, is that something that, that you struggle with? Well, I, I, I perceive that as, as a misunderstanding of what the Gospel says, but equally they would perceive what I believe as a misunderstanding as well. So mm -hmm. it's, it's... I mean, being a true liberal, one has to be able to step into the shoes of the other person and say, well, actually, yes, there, there are times... There, I might be wrong. I might be wrong to their view. Um, but I, I think that perhaps brings us to that point of actually saying, you know, that, that I think we've, we've noted actually in the way that you've spoken this evening that even between people that would say I'm not a person of faith and, and, and people that are, they've often got more in common <laughs> than, than people that perhaps belong to the so-called same faith. And I wonder, I wonder whether you would want to, just as we perhaps begin to, to draw our discussion to a conclusion, about you know coming back to the whole thing about society and caring for each other and looking at that you know that lo that the lovely picture of the geese and the way that they actually help each other um, actually how, how we can how can we work together really to to reestablish a, a code of conduct where we really do truly work for the common good and 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 do respect um, all 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 human life and indeed all life um, as precious and 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 to be respected. I think, interestingly, Andy was the first of the two of us to declare that he didn't hold a formal Christian belief, and I'm the other one. But actually, I agree entirely with Peter. Um, we have a section of British society who are overlooked, is probably the nicest way of phrasing it, the poor, the homeless. How many of us have walked past the man on the street who's looking for a handout because he's homeless, he hasn't got an address so he can't a job etc and we just walk past them um, so I, I agree I think there's an awful lot of similarity between the moral position of those of us who do not declare ourselves to be Christian and people who are liberal Christians in, a, in an English or a British rather than or European even rather than an American model where you earn the right to be included in society one of the one of the challenges is though isn't it, nowadays in modern society is getting that whether or not one has faith oneself is getting that Christian code of conduct out there and getting it operationalized and I think that, you know if we go back in time when when it was typical to go to church you respected what you heard in church and you listened to it and not everybody lived their life by that but there was power in what was said at church and now, in, in the age that we live in, with the internet, with social media, everybody's an expert in their, in their own thing. And everybody's in their, you know, we use the term echo chamber, where you hear what you want to hear, and what you want to hear is what, what you, you're speaking. And I think it's a real challenge to re-establish those fundamentals. Not that we've all lost them, because we haven't. But overall, there seems to be creep away from them and I think that's difficult and I'm, I'm kind of interested Peter in what you think what do we have to do irrespective of whether people are you know believe in God how do we get that message back well it might sound counterintuitive but one way might be rebuilding from the NHS outward I mean because it seems to me that you know that the, the, the reverence in which the, the National Health Service is held and the ideals that it represents you know, so many British people think that it represents the best of us, and that, in a sense, you know, protecting the NHS, you know, from uh, you know uh, privatisation and government cutbacks and th things like that is you know probably something that we all need to do. But in a sense, to encourage people to think about well, why do they value the NHS? What about it? And then think well, you know, what other parts of our society might benefit from from that approach and that sense of 
generosity and equality and that you know it, it belongs to us all and, and we saw that in covid didn't we we saw you know during the period of the lockdown you could walk around norwich streets and there wasn't any homeless because they'd all been moved into yeah, being looked and, and we can do that because somehow it seems to be good at that moment in time but it would be good at all times yes. we could do that okay we can't move them all into bed and breakfast accommodation hotels and things because they're occupied by other people but it was that coming together of a sense of community which i think was something very positive that came out of COVID, which we are in danger now of losing. Yes, and I think that, that, I mean, that, as I say, might be a very good point at which to finish, really, that there have been some very good things coming out of, uh, of the current crisis that hopefully we will be able to capture and, and, and continue with. I think one of the great things that we've discovered this evening as well is that actually as faith talks to science, some really important things come out of that. And of course, that's one of the things that we're very excited about in having Dippy in the cathedral, is it's going to raise all these big questions. Actually, you know, people have got so much to bring to, to the conversations. And, and actually, we hope that you know, this is really going to spark some very interesting things in the future, but also not just conversations, but then actually changing the way that we live um, in terms of, of our real care for one another, our care for the environment, and, uh, and actually the way that we want to look after things so we've got, got, got this world to pass on to future generations. So can I say thank you, a very, a very big thank you to all of you, and to those of you that have been listening to us, um, we very much hope that you will perhaps have some questions that you want to send in, and if you um, go onto our website, you'll see that there's a, a web, um, a, uh, an email address, science at cathedral.org.uk, and send your questions in, and we'll try our best to answer those. Um, and also, just to say that our, our next uh, conversation like this will be in the week beginning the 26th of October, um, when we should be focusing on blood and organ donation and some of the big questions around those issues. So thank you for joining us and we hope we'll see you again soon.